Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module um, that's part of the catch-up sessions of the WITS RHI Advanced HIV and TB training. Uh, this session is going to be on PMDCT and there's actually going to be lots of little modules on PMDCT. In the first one now we're going to be covering the management of the newly pregnant HIV positive woman. Just want to acknowledge WITS RHI for these slides, PEPFAR for our funding. And please note that all the recommendations in these presentations will be based on the National Consolidated ARV Guidelines. So it's always good to start with good news. I've got a few background slides. Um, and this is just a slide to show that at the moment, 2015, very recent data, South Africa, certainly in the southern and eastern Africa, has a very high coverage um, of women receiving effective art during pregnancy, uh, which is reducing our mother-to-child transmission. And um, this knowledge has actually been known for some time, that there is ways that we can prevent the HIV-infected mother of passing the virus on to her child. And this is a very dramatic slide showing um, from 1993 how we've managed to reduce mother-to-child transmission with effective art. In this slide, we can see how effective art in pregnancy is directly related to reducing new infections among children. And the better your PMDCT coverage, um, the less children you will see with new HIV infections. And we have very much seen this in South Africa. But to be able to reach um, elimination of mother-to-child transmission, which is the long-term goal, we have to apply these great guidelines, these great protocols to every single woman. And we're going to be going through a few of the basic principles um, on what we need to do for our pregnant woman who's also HIV positive. So the first key point here that we're looking at is uh, a simple principle called no turnaways. And it simply states that all women who attend a facility for pregnancy confirmation or for an ANC first visit booking um, must be seen on that day. So it's been quite traditional because antenatal takes a bit more time that if the woman arrives, one would sometimes diagnose them that they're pregnant and then give them another day to come in for a proper workup. And unfortunately, we see that lots of women do not necessarily return. It's difficult to get time off work and they now know, OK, I'm pregnant and might only come um, long after 20 weeks. And so therefore, it's absolutely essential to already uh, capture them and get them onto treatment on the day that you see them. The other important principle is very vigilant HIV testing during pregnancy. Obviously, all women to be counseled and tested for HIV at their first visit, um, but all HIV negative women must be retested regularly, and we'll look at that in a minute. Very important then, and this we know is now under UTT, we're doing it for all our patients. So all HIV positive patients now qualify for ARVs, but in HIV positive women that are pregnant, they actually get initiated on ART on the same day. We're not yet doing that for our non-pregnant patients, um, but it's a priority in pregnant women. So how often should we do HIV testing? This slide is going to focus on the recommendations of the National um, consolidated guidelines of 2015. Um, in the HCT guideline that's come out in the last year, they're actually recommending testing at every visit or testing at every opportunity. Um, and I think that is probably an ideal. But as a minimum, all HIV negative women must be retested every three months during pregnancy. On the day that they're going to labor or when they're delivering, no matter when they last tested, you have to do another HIV test again. At the six weeks EPI visit, um, we will do another test. So you'll notice those two tests are actually quite close to each other. Um, and this is to make sure that we pick women up who might be converting during that time. And then again, if they're breastfeeding, three monthly ongoing during the breastfeeding and more often if the opportunity arises. So why are we testing so much? This should be quite obvious. A very high viral load gives you a much higher risk of transmission. And a lot of the PMDCT cases that we are seeing where children are getting infected is mothers who are converting during pregnancy. For when you convert, you have a very, very high viral load and there's a much higher risk of transmission. And so if we want to eliminate mother-to-child transmission, your EMTCT, 
We have to find these maternal seroconversions very early. We need to get them onto ARV and we need to get the babies onto appropriate prophylaxis. A few other pointers. Um, all HIV negative women must obviously be repeatedly counseled about ongoing HIV prevention. Um, of course, most women who have fallen pregnant have not been using condoms. So a lot of them don't necessarily consider now introducing condoms once they are pregnant. And therefore, that has to be a specific part of your counseling as well as providing them with condoms to protect them. We will therefore also see a much higher conversion um, of HIV women, of women to HIV positive during pregnancy than we do in the normal population because these women are a known group that is having unprotected um, sexual intercourse. Of course, testing of the male partner and getting the male partner involved, very important, and ongoing your TB screening at every visit. These few little things is actually our primary prevention of HIV and is from one of PMTCT, an essential part of long-term um, preventing children from being infected with HIV. So what is the principle for HIV positive women if we do diagnose them? This used to be quite a complicated slide over the years. It's been evolving and now it's become really simple. All patients who's HIV positive qualify for lifelong art. In pregnant women, they all qualify and they're all urgent and they all require ARVs on the same day of being seen. We are not going to go into detail into counselling. This is more covered within the primary healthcare programmes but there's a few essential things that must be included when you're speaking to the mother. We obviously have to just think about HIV in itself and what the new diagnosis must mean for a young woman who's also now pregnant. Um, but of course, a big part of the conversation must be about mother to child transmission, what the risks are and how the mother can reduce those risks. Infant feeding should be discussed throughout and especially under the new, um, with the new PMTCT, um, programs that we have that are so effective, infant feeding and breastfeeding is back on the agenda in a very, very big way, and women need to be hearing those messages from early on. We'll obviously already at this stage explain that she's going to be on lifelong art and the advantages of that and the importance of adherence and being retained in retention and care. Within all of this will be all of your um, uh, counselling regarding the ARVs that she's going to be taking, condom use, partner testing, etc. So we've now diagnosed a woman who's HIV positive, she's pregnant, and we now need to do some of the basic workup. First off, we're obviously going to do a really good clinical examination to be able to WHO stage her, but very important, this includes a mental health examination and just check if there's any active psychiatric disease. We're also going to take some bloods that are specific to the fact that we've just started her on the FDC. And in the guidelines, this includes the creatinine and CD4. I would like to mention here hepatitis B because it is not clear in the guideline. So hepatitis B screening was recommended for all adults routinely, and but was not specifically mentioned for pregnant women. Personally, I think hepatitis B screening is important in our HIV positive women. Otherwise, we cannot give the appropriate prophylaxis um, for the baby at birth. These results obviously has to be followed up within, week, within a week. But regardless of the fact that we're also looking at HIV, she's also pregnant. So in addition to all of the above, we're also going to do our TB and STI screening. And I think STI screening gets forgotten quite often. TB, I would hope every woman is being screened for TB. And with screening, I mean asking about symptoms, not necessarily sending um, any investigations. And then, of course, your normal bunk blood, so your hemoglobin um, to check for anemia, your RPR or rapid TPHA, depending on what you have, RH, your urine dipstick not to be forgotten, and to start your mom on the appropriate micronutrients. And if you do have access to Mom Connect, very important to register them on Mom Connect, um, a great um, little system to help keep our moms up to date with important information about their pregnancy. So pretty straightforward. Um, in what you need to look for on that first day that you're seeing your mom with HIV. Just a word about pregnant adolescents and what regimens we would use in our pregnant adolescents. And just note that anybody under 19, we still consider an adolescent. So if you have an 18-year-old that's coming in, that's also considered to be adolescent. 
but all adolescents, if they're pregnant and they weigh more than 40 kilograms, we can use the FTC, the fixed dose combination with tenofovir, imidacitabine, and efavirenz. And it doesn't matter if they um, are less than 15 years of age, like it is for other adolescents. The reason for this is that the big concern with tenofovir use normally in adolescents is if the child is not yet through their growth spurt. And to be able to fall pregnant, children would have already reached the necessary bone maturity that they can manage um, to not her without any problems. If they weigh less than 40 kilograms, we just have to do a dose adjustment. We can still use to not her 300 milligrams and the 3ATC 300 milligrams daily, but we have to use a reduced efavirenz dose of 400 milligrams, and so they'll be on separate tablets until they're over 40 kilograms. And our adolescents, it's very important, even the 17, 18-year-olds, um, that we have youth-friendly services and that we create a support network for those children. They quite often are the ones who present late, um, often have complications both in pregnancy and delivery, and certainly needs extra care during their pregnancy. So we've done our baseline bloods, um, which we've sent away, and we now want to start the ARVs. And it's very simple. We have this wonderful once-a-day tablet with Sinofovir, FTC, and Efavirenz, um, which we can start almost more than 90% of our patients. We can start that safely. But there are three scenarios where you will hesitate in starting this regimen, and you might have to consider doing something else. The first is if you're worried about abnormal renal function, and we are going to look at these in a bit more detail in the next slides. The second one is any patient with active psychiatric illness. And thirdly, anyone that you are concerned that they might have TB, so you're busy doing TB investigations. So those are three very worthwhile remembering. Renal function, psychiatric illness, TB, you may not be able to give them the FTC today. But if you can't give them the full ARV triple therapy today, you must still give them something to protect the baby. And therefore, we will then initiate those mothers on AZT, 300 milligrams BD, until we can make a decision about what regimen they're going to be on. Um, and this is very important in terms of the long-term cover of the baby specifically. So let's look at those three contraindications. So the first one is, is renal dysfunction. And as we know, the tenofovir is associated with renal toxicity. And so if there is renal problems, we might want to be a bit careful in using tenofovir. Um, and therefore, we will not use FTC if we're concerned that we think the creatinine might be abnormal. And those scenarios, for example, would be if the mom has diabetes or hypertension, or if there's any previous kidney conditions that requires hospitalization. So if you've got a history of a, of a mom who's been operated on for her kidneys, um, and that does not include um, UTIs. And if on the day you find more than two plus proteinuria on your urine dipstick. So in all of those scenarios, we're going to send off a creatinine and we're actually going to put them on AZT as long as the hemoglobin is over 7 grams. If the hemoglobin is under 7, I would discuss them, partly also because we have to find out why is the hemoglobin so low, um, but D4T might be another option. So say we've now got a mommy we're concerned about renal dysfunction, we've sent a creatinine, we've put her on AZT, we're going to bring her back in a week to make a decision on what we're going to do. And if the creatinine now comes back normal, so under 85 micromoles, then we can actually initiate our tenofovir, imidacitabine, and efavirenz, no problem. But if the creatinine is over 85, that's quite high for a pregnant woman. So we can't use our normal EGFR or formulas in the pregnant woman because there's a baby that's also making a part of her weight. Um, and we also know that women, pregnant women actually have very low creatinines usually because of the hemodilution. So creatinine over 85 in a pregnant woman is considered a high-risk pregnancy. Um, and it must, must, must be discussed. So you will, before, if you're not able to get hold of an expert, you might use AZT in the meantime, or you would have an urgent telephonic consultation to discuss which regimen to use. And in the majority of them, we would use a back of a 3TC and efavirenz. Um, but the reason why you're consulting is because of the concern of a pregnant woman who has renal dysfunction. And there has to be urgent investigation and management of that re renal disease. If the creatinine is under 85, but there's 2 plus proteinuria, you still also need to follow that up 
to find out what the cause of that is and also to help you as a baseline um, for later in pregnancy um, and to make sure that there's nothing else pregnancy related that's causing that protein to creep up. Our second contraindication to the FTC is active psychiatric illness. Um, and we do not use the fixed dose combination um, off the cuff in these patients. And this is high risk pregnancies. A patient with psychiatric illness is vulnerable to a variety of challenges, um, and not least of all, actually taking her ARVs. So you want to discuss and refer and have a psychiatrist involved with these patients. And with discussion, you can use a alternative triple drug regimen that does not have efavirenz, which is our concerning drug. So if the CD4 is under 250, we would use tenofovir, 3TC, and nevirapine. Um, if it's over 250, we could use tenofovir, 3TC, and lupinavir, ritonavir. That saying, the use of nevirapine in pregnancy is very controversial, and therefore you will only make this decision in discussion with a consultant. Um, and then our focus needs to be on getting the psychiatric disorder uh, stabilized. It might be that if it's early in pregnancy, you might just use the AZT, the simpler, slightly simpler, less tablets, um, while you settle the psychiatric disorder before you start on the more complicated triple regimens. Just to note that active psychiatric illness does not include depression or anxiety that doesn't require treatment, or if you've got a known psychiatric patient who's very well controlled or asymptomatic on treatment. And in those patients, actually, the FDC or the fixed dose combination that includes efavirenz will still be your first choice. Just remember a last few things around the counseling. Um, explain to the mom up front all the monitoring bloods that's going to be happening. It's useful for the mom to even remind uh, the nurses about her viral load or her kidney functions, for example. And you have to have a discussion around efavirenz. There's been a lot of talk many years ago of concerns around efavirenz causing um, neurodevelopmental uh, defects in babies. Uh, there is thousands and thousands and thousands of mothers who have now fallen pregnant on efavirenz, and the data does not show an increased risk. Once a pharmaceutical company, though, has put certain risks within a package insert, they cannot change those. Um, and therefore, you have to pre-counsel the mom, otherwise she will be alarmed when she, she reads the package insert saying that it's not for use in pregnancy. Um, it's certainly safer than avirapine, and our protease inhibitors has also got potential risks and might increase the chance of preterm birth. So none of them is great, um, and efavirenz at the moment is seen to be the best option. Um, and important to chat about side effects of the fixed dose combination, uh, actually most of self-limiting and our are not a problem. Efavirenz probably being the biggest issue with all its um, neuro uh, side effects, such as a bit of insomnia or dizziness um, or feeling a bit low or feeling a bit high. And most of it settles down beautifully within a few weeks. The other bloods is exactly the same as our normal um, monitoring for HIV patients that are not pregnant. We're going to do our creatinine at 3, 6, and 12 months and then annually for patients on tenofovir. We want to do the CD4 baseline, again, at 12 months, and then annually if clinically indicated. Just interesting why we still do a CD4 baseline as we're putting everybody onto ARVs. Um, but remember, if the CD4 is under 350 or if they've got stage 2, 3, or 4 disease, we also need to start cotrimoxazole, very important in our pregnant women with their high risk of respiratory infections. Um, and if the CD4 is under 100, the, la the laboratory will do an automatic cryptococcal antigen screening test. Um, and those women who are found to be CRAG positive and pregnant needs to be discussed with an expert due to the risks of fluconazole in the first trimester. Thank you very much. That was a quick overview on initiating our pregnant woman. Um, please see the particularly details on monitoring of the viral load in pregnant women in um, part three of this series.